If you agree, I will talk more about what I'm worried about today. And it's not a, not a kind of, it's not a presentation, it's more like a lot of questions, uh, things that make me really confused, and maybe you have a few answers, or we would develop those answers together. I have that, it's, it's a combination of questions. I have um, this very unusual privilege, if it's a privilege, that I used to work in a museum in Germany, in Dresden, as the director of 14 or 12 museums in Dresden, bombed by the British Army and rebuilt after 1945. Now I'm the director of the Victoria and Urban Museum in London, bombed by the German Army, and we still have a lot of shrapnel impacts on our facade. Why do I mention that? I think we all used in a certain way to iconoclasm, to destruction, to work with copies, to rebuild buildings, to rebuild cities, to re reinvent cities, to reinvent the life of cities, but we forgot it. It's just not part of our daily practice. I mean, Herman, probably talking about the Humboldt Forum, this is another kind of re replica and how we live with it in a city and what does it mean for urban development. So we started in the VNA a few years ago when the conflict in Syria started to discuss that topic again and again because we have an amazing Syrian collection working with Damascus for 160 years. In that fact, you don't ignore it, you start to worry, I mean, to work with partners to worry about it, to ask what we can do, and what most of our partners in Syria said is, do your homework. Don't worry so much, I mean, worry about us, but do your homework. And that was quite interesting to understand what it means. It was about illegal trade, it was, but it was, and it was about the collection. But at the same time, it was the discussion about what is it, how do you rebuild, how do you make the documentaries, how do you work with the situation in order to prevent that we even can't rebuild or reconstruct parts of Syria. But it's just a part, passport toto. It's just part of what we want to do and discuss in the future. So I give you a, a, just a few ideas of what replica means for us today and how we work in the museum's field about it. And the one thing that makes me really confused, and I want to say it in the beginning, is that I worked for, in my professional life for the last 30, 35 years, always with the opinion, being totally convinced that there is only one erratic object, that everything is about the single erratic object, the original. And suddenly I'm confused because there are series, there are replicas, there are replicas on a very high level. What does it mean for a museum? What does it mean for the art market? Um, in a certain way, to make it even more complicated, museums are somehow not only the children of enlightenment, but also the children of destruction. Because um, all those objects destroyed in wars in the end ended in storage and in museums. Um, or secularization, mid-19th century, made the museums even richer or more rich. So what I mean is it's the combination of both the authentic piece and the replica. So what we started right now is to go back into our own collection. And if you have the chance to come to the V&A, the Victoria and Alban Museum, not last night in the dinner, somebody thought I'm the director of the Victoria Secret Museum. Uh, I'm still somehow confused. It's Victoria and Albert. So, if you come to the VNA, we have this amazing, beautiful cast course. Honestly, don't miss it. It's a bit like, like Jurassic Park in culture. Casts, copies of the cathedral, the portal of Santiago de Compostela, Drasham Column. It was made in the 19th century when, rightly, People thought they will never travel to those places, let the object travel to the people. It was an education program. So this is still existing, and it's an extremely modern version of what we do today with 3D printing and more. So what we decided, and just to add another layer to what I'm trying to, to explain to you, we received an invitation, a very unusual invitation, from the Venice Biennale for Architecture this year to work on, a, on an, uh, an exhibition together called A World of Fragile Object. 
So whatever I do right now is a kind of advertisement because I want you to meet in Venice in our exhibition and see the replica there. Come on. So those are, the, those are the basic ideas. Those are the core messages. What is the practice of copying? What has it meant in the 19th century and how can we use it today? And what technology did we need at that time and what technology do we need today? The exhibition in Venice has five major topics. It's about urgency of what happens today. It's the 19th century, a spectacle of copies, the value of copy, new technology, and imagining the 21st century cast court. And unfortunately, this is not working. <laughs> now it's coming, but it's really slow. Urgency means acts of violence, climate changes, mass tourism, urbanization, neglect, accident, or natural disasters. It's really slow. What you see in the VNA is exactly the way they displayed these casts. I'm sorry I'm faster than... Can somebody help me behind the scenes here? Perfect. And can we go to the next? Perfect. This is one of the reasons why we are so attractive today with the cast cords, because a lot of original objects, like in this case the Trashum column, is because of environmental impacts pretty much destroyed. So archaeologists, conservation people now travel to the VNA and make copies of the copy of the copy. Which is really amazing that how you see how it's needed and what how we work with it. So what does it mean if we use it today. Next slide, please. I think that's better. Yes, perfect. This is one of my favorite topics. This, I know it looks a bit weird for you. And it's, by the way, pretty much related to Manhattan. We have a, his name is Henry Arnhold. We have a sponsor supporter in the VNA, and we had him, him in Dresden. Henry comes, I mean, originally from, from Dresden. Um, his family had a, an incredible Meissen collection before they were forced to emigrate. They still have a collection to rebuild it again. And in our collection in the VNA is something called Brühl Table Fountain. It's a bit weird, isn't it? Table Fountain. Actually, this is the Table Fountain. It was made for probably for a celebration, a wedding, marriage, something like this in Dresden. We don't know it exactly. I'm not sure if on that table was water or champagne or wine, but anyhow, it's an amazing Meissen technology of the 17th century. The VNA had parts of it, but just parts of it. So with the help of the University in Dresden, sponsored by our friend here in Manhattan, we started a research project. We found the, the, the missing links in Meissen in the archives. We 3D printed those links and made the casts out of it, and finally, with the help of the Meissen factory, we rebuilt it. So what I mean, it's, it's like 16th, 17th century history and 21st century technology coming together. The question is, do we have to show to the public, to the audience, to our visitor, that this is replaced? Are we honest? Or, just to use another example from my own life, the palace in Dresden, just to came, if you come to, to Dresden, the palace in Dresden, completely reconstructed, is probably the most beautiful palace ever in Dresden because we, take, we took different parts of the history and combined it to one beautiful solution. But it was never the, the, it's not the one that existed before. Next slide, please. What I like is this kind of confusing, what Bertolt Brecht calls the Verfremdungseffekt, the alienation effect, if you suddenly have a copy and you see both. This was 1999, Weimar. Um, Weimar, the European uh, capital of culture. Um, Goethe's garden house, that's where I used to live. Small house, they didn't want to have all the visitors ruining this little building. Um, so they built a copy next to it. And that was the, the exciting thing. It was not so much about this is where you can go to and the other one is the original one. It was just to see both. 
and suddenly it was a kind of pilgrimage to go to Weimar and see both garden houses next to each other. What is it exactly? What makes it so exciting? Um, next slide, please. I mean, we all know this famous quote by Walter Benjamin. Actually, it's somehow the motto of my professional life, that there is only the one authentic piece and um, everything is, let's say, based on the aura of that authentic piece. I had a lecture yesterday at the MIT in Boston. And in the end, an Italian student, Umberto, just sent me an email, came to see me and said, Martin, I think there's something you should know. Have you ever heard about Petralix Tissau's paradox? I don't know if you ever heard about that, Herman. Um, I didn't. The question is, if you, Petralix, if you replace a ship step by step, no, not replace, sorry. If you repair a ship step by step, beam by beam, wooden part by wooden part, is the very slowly in a due, I mean, a length of time, replay, if restored ship, is it still the original ship? Or is it a new ship? Is it still the aura of the original? Or is it a new ship? And I think, I mean, it sounds like a basic question, but honestly, this is somehow the raison d'etre of the way we work and how we work together and what it means for the future. A lot of new, next slide please, a lot of, lot of new technologies and I mean you are the experts, you know much better what we can do right now and how we work with it. I was in Washington yesterday morning, the Smithsonian and the Renwick Gallery has this beautiful sculpture, the slave, the Greek slave, now 3D printed in the entrance space. Pretty much confusing. A great way to look at it and to ask the question what's the original, where is the original, where does it come from? So a lot of new technologies, satellite tools, measurements of our collectual size. I mean, Herman, you are the expert for that. And uh, the question is how we do, how we work with this data, this amazing material for the future. The strange thing to talk about Dresden again, and it's pretty scary. I think I never really talked in public about it. Part of the Dresden reconstruction of the museums and the palace was done with material that Hitler commissioned before 1939, knowing probably that when he started the war, all those stuff would be destroyed. So we worked with plans with the swastika in it, which is really boring and scary, knowing that they knew before what will happen after. Um, this new technology, next slide please, this new technology, next slide please, needs to a, leads to a lot of uh, amazing new things. This is, I mean, I'm sure you read it in the newspaper, Trafalgar Square, just um, a few days ago, the presentation of Palmyra, the Ark of Palmyra in, in the mid of London. A lot of very controversial debates. Um, UNESCO not really happy with it. Um, and the question in the end is more or less, if we have the data, if we measure everything, let's destroy it, we can rebuild it. Herman, this is, that slide is for you, even not knowing that we will be on the same stage. Um, is, and I really, I think it's, honestly, it's a very unusual encounter just to sit here to meet each other and say, Can't, let's go on the stage together. I hope it will work for you. Um, it's um, Nofrotiti. I mean, I'm sure you know the real story. The story I know from the media is that someone walked into the Neues Museum with an iPhone. I don't think an iPhone was not enough obviously with an iPhone, scanning Nofrotite and uh, put it on, on the web and everybody can use it and 3D print it if they want to do it. That's the story I heard. Or, next slide please. Ah, next slide please. That's something I find really scary. It's about uh, modernist buildings. I mean, you know, modernist buildings are not, um, God, not in fashion right now. Um, because of social housing. The question is, can we take it down, make um, documentaries first, collect all the data, and build replicas in a different size just to keep it for the future. Even more confusing for me is, next slide please, is that Piranesi design, just sketches, things that he never built, are suddenly built by that very famous Madrid-based company Factum Arte, and they end in museums on a very high level. 
never existed, was never an object before, was just a drawing or a sketch. Is it an original or is it not? We are used, next slide please, we are used to um, original spaces like caves and um, or in this case it's the tomb of Tutankhamun, uh, also rebuilt by Factum Arte so that the original part was, is not destroyed by visitors but you see the imitation, the copy of the real. Next slide. Something that I think is really fascinating. I don't know if you read it, it's just a few days ago. It was published in the Netherlands. It's done by, I mean, it's not an artist, his name is Bas Kosten. It's called The Next Rembrandt, 2016. Um, he's a data analyst, the artist. And what he did is he collected 168,000 fragments from Rembrandt paintings and painted a new Rembrandt, saying that the only way to paint a new Rembrandt has to be done by Rembrandt himself. Great idea. What does it mean? How do we work with it in the future? Is this um, kind of original or what is it? Just to come to the end, next slide. Empty space. My team is right now in Venice working on that exhibition. If it happens that you come to Venice, Venice to the Venice Biennale, please come to see us. Thank you. <laughs>